Okay, Doc. Uh, first, thanks for all the wonderful information. I have a couple of questions. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned in an earlier uh, Q&A video that you use a Remedex for your AI. You talked about Fimera being used uh, for tough, uh, tough cases, and you also said Aromasin may also be used. I tried a Remedex and found it, uh, found it that it caused, uh, caused me an upset stomach. Uh, please detail if Aromasin would be a, a good choice and a comparable dosage on a milligram by milligram basis to a Remedex. And question number two, how do you structure your weekly protocol uh, in regard to the timing of the HCG administration, AI usage, and testosterone injection? I wish to maximize my HRT and minimize estradiol uh, side effect. Many thanks. Garrett. Two-part question there, right? Yeah. Pretty much? Yeah. So, uh, Femara or Letrozole is a stronger aromatase inhibitor than an astrozole. It was actually the first one they uh, invented in their R&D. I forget the company that made them. but. Uh, because there was a mild, and it was a mild uh, enzyme, liver enzyme elevation, they went to anastrozole instead of letrozole. But remember, all these were invented originally to treat uh, women with breast cancer, so that we could, you know, bury the estrogen, estrogen sensitive breast cancer. Uh, again, though, and probably with the right intent, certainly with the right intent, because of the, the liver enzyme elevation, we got something a little weaker, and it worked out well because. You know, and guys, when uh, I mean, I, I don't really see any reason for using letrozole in hormone replacement therapy. The only time I've ever seen it used where it was needed, if you will, is where guys were just aromatizing left and right, and they were using so much of an aromatizable, you know, for example, testosterone, uh, that you know that was the only thing that worked to keep the E2 within well, total estrogens within a normal or optimal range. Um, Side effects I've seen with letrozole, not just because you're burying the estrogen, <clears throat> but because I think that, in my experience, there are some things that come along with letrozole itself. Typically, it's just libido issues, erectile dysfunction issues. It just buries you sexually, so it's just not worth going there unless, again, you have some odd reason to use it. Um, the alternatives, yeah, you can use aromasin, and generally speaking, in my experience, uh, a milligram of anastrozole will equate to 25 milligrams of aromasin or eczemastain as the prior person used the term. Uh, how often to use it? That all depends. I mean, how, how much control do you need? There is a different MOA with eczemastain than with anastrozole, but again, in effect, it's remarkably similar. I mean, it might be different by 3% depending upon the study you read and effectiveness. So those are pretty interchangeable, yeah. Um, What's the protocol when mentioning testosterone, HCG, and, and, and AI? Yeah, the timing. Again, it all depends. Yeah. What I try to do with patients, and again, it depends on each individual, how quickly you're metabolizing the testosterone. Okay, you've got, on average, and this varies widely as I've seen in my practice, but on average, and I say that because it doesn't come close sometimes, but you're going to see a, a peak in testosterone on about day two and a half after you inject, okay, if you're doing weekly injections. Let's say day two and a half, and that's gonna tail down there for the remainder until your next injection seven days later. Anastrozole has a much shorter half-life. I'm using Cipionate, for example, with my testosterone, which has an eight-day half-life, right? Uh, anastrozole has a 48-hour, two-day half-life. So, you're gonna to have to punctuate that more frequently into your week. And some people, if they metabolize the testosterone in a tighter, tighter, excuse me, in a more narrow, tighter, uh, you can use just an every other day uh, an astrozole dosing to keep that tighter, narrow, and of course, event, uh, ultimately keep your estrogen, or, or particularly you know the estradiol, which is what we use as a surrogate mark for estrogens, in a nice narrow range, I like to keep between 15 to 20 picograms per milliliter. I know I'm giving you way too much information, but the idea is to keep them within range. If you have someone who really bounces up very high with their testosterone as soon as they inject, so that say day two is, you know, and this is, I've seen it, you know, 3,200, even more uh, uh, nanograms per deciliter, more than likely, They've climbed out of the body's comfort zone in that you know the high side of the titer, and so it's gonna the body's gonna make a lot more estrogen than typical 
uh, of most other patients. So that instead of going every other day and maintaining a nice narrow titer with the, uh, uh, a Remedex, we're going to have to front load, if you will, in the week to cover that big bump in testosterone with Remedex. Mm. Okay, so we, we can still keep it in range. So um, I'm explaining why I can't just give a pat answer. Oh, well, you do your ACG on this day and you do your no, testosterone no, this day. No, no, it's that big sense though. Typically though, I don't prescribe the first dose of a Remedex in either of those two cases uh, until the day after your injection. Sometimes we get a little more uh, precise and we might say, okay, you're, if you do your testosterone injection and you start metabolizing into estrogen very quickly, do your testosterone in the morning, take your Remedex at night mm. or not till the following morning because it, it typically doesn't climb that fast. And again, we do need estrogen, so we don't want to bury the estrogen at the beginning or the end. We want to keep it at you know that 15 to 20 picograms per milliliter. So that I can say in general, you know, let your body start to convert a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, I'm I'm really generalizing because everyone's different. And if we have a dose from the front side of that testosterone injection carrying over, right. doing it every other day. You know, that throws that off a little bit too because yeah. you already have a measure coming into your next injection. So, uh, HCG, ditto, same idea. You're not getting, for the most part, unless you're dealing with uh, what to me has become a more rare uh, form of replacement therapy in that hybrid of, you know, ah, you're borderline, you're young, uh, you're still producing some endogenous and we can get something out of your testicles. Uh, versus, you know, uh, the the fifty year old. Um, some people, will, in other words, use ACG for their testosterone, and that makes it more complicated. Most people that I'm dealing with, say a fifty five year old male, you're not gonna. You can stimulate the testicles all day long, and they're saying, "We've been done for years, pal." <laughs> you're not getting anything testosterone wise out of the ACG. What you're getting is typically an attempt at maintaining some function to maintain fertility or some function to maintain uh, testicular size. Mm -hmm. You know, it's cosmetic. Yeah. Cosmetic or fertility reasons. The only reason why you're using HCG. So it doesn't really matter when you're dosing, you're just sending a signal that is not otherwise being sent by the pituitary in the form of luteinizing hormone through this analog of LH, HCG, to hey, don't go to sleep on me yet, testicles. It's not gonna work just any better when you left. Gotcha. So yeah, it really doesn't matter as long as you're getting regular, uh, and everyone's a little different there too. Some people, hey, as long as I nudge them once a week, and age is a factor, genetics is a factor, yeah. chronicity of use of testosterone is a factor. So uh, you gotta kind of see what works best for you. Nice, good answer. Thanks, Doc.